Bé, molt bon dia, autoritats. Permeteu-me començant fent un agraïment a la col·laboració amb el Departament d'Acció Exterior i de la Unió Europea, i en particular el director general, el Gerard Vives, i el seu equip, perquè quan vam començar a dissenyar aquests MedCap Days, la veritat és que jo era profundament, particularment, gent de l'equip de l'IEMED no, però jo era particularment escèptic per les incerteses del calendari, perquè comptàvem els dies i dèiem que els MedCap Days d'enguany cauen amb el debat d'investidura del nou president de la Generalitat. Però he de dir que va ser la visió del director general i del departament que em van fer creure en la possibilitat i en la viabilitat d'organitzar aquesta cinquena edició dels MedCat Days i la prova és aquesta, és que efectivament ho hem pogut fer i hem pogut treballar molt bé al llarg d'aquests darrers 3-4 mesos amb el departament i voldria fer aquest agraïment inicial. Allow me now to switch uh, into English because the rest of the, uh, of the speakers uh, will probably understand me better um, by saying that I had very little sleep uh, last night because my, my flight, apparently there was a, there was a depression uh, in Italy <laughs> and uh, flight uh, got delayed, so my brain is, is a bit uh, slower than, than usually, but it's an honor to, uh, to moderate this session uh, with, uh, with such a distinguished uh, speakers uh, on the topic of staying uh, on course against all odds, uh, tackling climate change in times uh, of multiple crises. And the point here is that, as the uh, preceding speakers uh, already said, we are at a time where, from the side uh, of the European Union, uh, at least, we have the best possible uh, policy framework to advance the, uh, the struggle, um, the fight against, uh, against climate change. If you remember back in February 2021, the, uh, the European Union institutions adopted the new agenda uh, for the Mediterranean, which recognizes for the first time that the uh, Mediterranean region and particularly the southern Mediterranean region, is one of the main hotspots uh, in the world as regards uh, climate change. But it also outlines the strategy that the region is home uh, to some of the world's best solar and wind uh, resources, which presents unprecedented opportunities uh, for clean energy uh, cooperation. Not to mention uh, what Ambassador Simone already, uh, already mentioned, the uh, European Green Deal that offers a unique opportunity for Euro-Mediterranean cooperation to work together to strengthen environmental, energy and climate change uh, resilience with a view to helping mitigate risks uh, to human lives and promote uh, sustainable development and transition to high uh, value sectors, among others, among creating uh, uh, jobs. I mean, you know that when it comes to the challenges that the region faces uh, in terms of, uh, of human development, the need to create jobs uh, is number one. And we know it in countries like Jordan, we know it in countries like, uh, like Tunisia, that there is a strong need uh, uh, to, create, uh, to create jobs, especially for, uh, for young people. And of course, in this context, uh, uh, the, uh, the green transition offers a unique opportunity um, uh, to create jobs. However, I have the impression that these policy frameworks that the EU has somehow put uh, uh, on the table are not always well profited uh, from the side of the southern and eastern Mediterranean countries. We have seen uh, a, a big progress in some of the, uh, in some of the countries, uh, notably in Morocco and Jordan, also to a certain extent in Egypt. Uh, we will now have a chance uh, to speak about it. Uh, but there is always um, the feeling 
that the disturbances that, uh, that our uh, president uh, was, uh, was speaking about earlier on are somehow colliding and are hindering uh, the path towards, uh, towards greater achievements uh, in terms of the, uh, of the green transition. Indeed, the environment has changed dramatically if we compare the situation uh, 15, uh, from 15 years ago. I mean, the geopolitical conditions uh, new rivalries, new conflicts, uh, even worse, as we are now witnessing uh, in the case of Gaza, are boycotting, uh, to a certain extent, uh, the green transition. And then also we need to be aware of that uh, climate emergency and the climate crisis has, uh, has accelerated. This is, of course, not helping, uh, but here we are, and I have to say that, um, that of course, there are good news and bad news. The good news is that uh, some countries are making tremendous efforts and uh, they are already offering uh, certain um, sound achievements. Uh, for instance, Jordan. I always speak uh, of Morocco, of the case of Morocco, so today I'm going to mention uh, Jordan. Uh, Jordan uh, has put in place a strategy uh, to increase uh, the use of renewables in the electricity uh, mix. A and uh, for instance, in 2022, 27% of the electricity mix, not of the primary energy mix, but the electricity mix in Jordan already came from uh, renewable energies, both, uh, well, you know that uh, Jordan doesn't have water, so it's not hydro, so mainly wind uh, and solar. And their target is to reach 30% uh, by 2030, which seems to be uh, a reasonable uh, target. Uh, but here, uh, yesterday, for instance, discussing that with the uh, Jordanian ambassador in, in Tunisia, he told me that informally the government is already fixing, setting a target of reaching 50% by 2030, which is quite ambitious uh, for the uh, standards uh, uh, of the countries that we are, uh, that we are talking about, right? Um, so this is a, a sign of optimism, that the region is changing that the region is not falling behind. It is true that the region is still too dependent on, 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 uh, on the use of uh, fossil fuels. We, we see it in, uh, in, sim, uh, in some of the countries, but there is, there is a breath of, uh, of optimism as well. Let's not forget that the World Bank Group, back in a report of, if I'm not mistaken, of 2016, so already eight years ago, uh, the IFC actually um, estimated that Egypt, Jordan, and Morocco alone would need around 100 billion US dollars in investment in renewable energy generation between 2016 and 2030 uh, to meet their uh, NDCs targets. And uh, 100 billion US dollars, of course, is a fortune. So here, the challenge is how we mobilize um, this big amount of money, right? Um, how we attract uh, investment into these uh, strategic uh, sectors. Um, of course, that progress has been made. Of course, that when some of you said that, um, that reforms needed to be put in place, that laws and bylaws needed to be adopted. I mean, we see it. We see it in countries like Morocco, in Tunisia, in Jordan, in Egypt. However, um, and this is one of the messages that I gave to some colleagues yesterday, even if laws and bylaws have been passed in most of, uh, of the countries of the region, uh, we need to look at how the implementation of this legislation uh, is being made. Because more important than the law that is being passed in Parliament is how you implement this law, how you make it real. Um, and we know that, that sometimes in some of the countries of the region, uh, well, we have this difficulty to, to implement uh, uh, the law of, uh, or the public policy. Uh, we have a lag there, and we need, uh, uh, and we need to work on that. Well, 
We have a, a, a wonderful uh, first uh, session. Uh, we will try to discuss and delve into four main uh, topics. First of all, an overview of the uh, governance strategy in the region steered by the institution that is in charge of uh, regional cooperation, namely the, uh, the UFM, and I'm very happy and proud to have the Deputy Secretary General of the UFM in charge of uh, environment and water, uh, which is a very important uh, portfolio. Uh, al Motaz Abadi, um, but we also want to discuss three more topics. Second of all, how the EU regards its cooperation with the uh, southern and eastern Mediterranean countries in the realm of energy cooperation and green transition in view of an environment that is changing, like we had the European Parliament elections uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago with the emergence of um, some parties that openly oppose the European Green Deal. We have French national elections, uh, the first round at least this week, and uh, unfortunately uh, the polls do not, uh, do not bring us or uh, entail us a lot of uh, optimism uh, on what can happen, uh, especially with regards to the, green, uh, to the green agenda, because there is the emergence of new political parties that openly, openly uh, oppose uh, uh, oppose the green uh, uh, the green deal and the green agenda, and in the context, as uh, Ambassador Simonet uh, already said, in the context of many new agreements MOUs that the European Commission and the EU institutions have signed with a number of countries, with uh, notably with Egypt, with Morocco, the EU uh, Morocco uh, Green Partnership, uh, with Tunisia, uh, even with Algeria uh, in the field of renewables. Then, third topic, uh, how are countries from the region combating climate change, especially in the field of uh, energy uh, transition? It's true that progress has been made, has been achieved uh, in the area of, uh, of mitigation uh, measures, uh, but a lot has to be still uh, said on the adaptation uh, strategies where the region is clearly uh, uh, lagging behind. And uh, speaking about uh, adaptation, um, well, uh, there is an ongoing initiative uh, on the Mediterranean Civil, civil uh, Protection Framework that the UFM put in place uh, a couple of years ago. So we also want to discuss uh, about how countries, and here the UFM uh, is instrumental, how countries are cooperating basically to um, uh, well, to help each other uh, and expressing solidarity to each other in uh, tackling civil protection uh, disasters, which are unfortunately, uh, and we saw it in Morocco and we saw it in, in Libya uh, more often uh, in the region. And to discuss uh, these four topics, we have a, a splendid panel uh, with us, uh, Deputy Secretary General uh, Al Motaz Abari, uh, researcher from, uh, uh, an advisor from ECO, uh, 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 Lorena, uh, researcher from ESP uh, Aldo, uh, and finally the uh, expert uh, of the French Ministry of Interior Affairs, and I would say the only one in the region that really knows about civil protection, or one of the very few, so I'm very happy that he's, uh, that he's decided to join us, uh, Laurent Alfonso. So, if you agree, we could, uh, we could start uh, with the UFM uh, Deputy uh, Secretary General, Ambassador um, Abadi. Uh, Ambassador Abadi is the uh, uh, Deputy uh, Secretary General uh, for two years now. Prior to that, he was uh, Director General in the same division. And prior to that, he was uh, a high official in the government of the Palestinian Authority. So we are um, very happy um, that you join us and you have, uh, you have the floor. OK, thank you very much, uh, Roger, for inviting us to this important discussion. And I was really very happy to see the title of the, of the MidCat uh, this year against all odds, I think maybe I can upgrade it. Although all turbulence around us, the political ones and also the issues related to the natural catastrophe that we are facing somehow related to the climate change because in the Mediterranean region, when we talk about the climate change, what we see, we see two things. One of them that is less water or too much water. And the second one that we are in short sleeve in November and December. So temperature and less resources. And this is, uh, will 
require us in the Union for the Mediterranean, where we are tackling the regional cooperation between north, south, 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 as well as the triangular cooperation, where absolutely we are not talking about a region that it is a geographical, it is a geographical region, but it's not a geopolitical entity. Unfortunately, it is not, and we know it. You start your talk about that there are a very good policy a framework that European Union put in place. Yes, we agree, because these are not approximated policy, they are unified policy for the 27 member states. And I think, and I believe, one of the key success for these policies that they are working, I'm not saying that 100%, it is one thing that the European Union don't depoliticize. That depoliticization, that depoliticizing is very important when it comes to not ignoring your main political issue. People in, in Brussels will not be speaking about the Green Deal and ignoring that there is a crisis in Ukraine and there are a war against Ukrainian people and also in the Eastern uh, Mediterranean. And the Mediterranean, the same. We cannot come to an institution putting policy framework of action for cooperation and we just wanted to ignore or we have taboo to talk about a main crisis happening in Gaza Strip, where it is challenging our, our, uh, our human identity. It is challenging our uh, future perspective. We cannot plan because we don't know what to do in the future. But this is something that one element that I want to emphasize that those policy framework, they cannot work if we don't have a political will. And this is why Europe have been successful in putting good policy framework because they have the policy that combined with political, that political will. Yes, now we, are, we don't know what will happen. Let us wait until November to see how, how the formulation of the new EU. But for us as a union for the Mediterranean, and in my work, the, dealing with the water, environment, and blue economy, they are the most uh, the things that they are on the table to solve our crises. I don't think that we will uh, be really successful if we just wanted to tackle the issue from technical point of view, that tackling the issue from technical point of view is a must, and we have to mobilize the best experts, but at the same time we have to keep doing the uh, political uh, engineering in the Mediterranean, doing uh, ministerial declaration, bringing uh, actors together to show case and to show benefits. Because any time I'm speaking about the water issue or the environment issue or the green transition or the blue economy, if I cannot explain it on dollar value or euro value, then the politician will not understand it. Are we doing so? I think yes, somehow we have some studies that they are doing here and there, uh, showing case, making countries working together, as you mentioned, the lesson learned approach or uh, exchange of experience. But at the end of the day, I think what is missing is that this cooperation to be both on the right place at the highest level in the political arena in the south. Here we talk about maybe the entity that uh, deal with the Europe, Arab League and the non-EU, non-Arab, that they have to be speaking about the Mediterranean all around the year, not only on November when we make the uh, Mediterranean uh, regional forum. And this is something that I think needs to be tackled from all directions. To come to the reality uh, related to what we face in the Mediterranean as well as in the world, today we hear the study of the World Bank that by 2030, not by 2040, 2030, we will have 40% gap between demand and supply in, on the water sector. And we have 35 uh, in the uh, demand and supply of energy sector. So these studies actually are exhausting us, are exhausting us because I think we put ink on paper more than the water availability. We put many efforts. That does not mean that we don't want to study. We need to study, we need to research, we need to do things. But what is going to make the difference is to move from dead speech into action. And this requires us to move and start thinking how to, uh, to bring resources to the region. In terms of water, we talk about now the issue, look at in Catalonia or in all uh, South Europe, we have uh, sakia in Espanol, uh, sakia or uh, drought. And this cannot be just faced by, by Christ. No, we have to look after the new resources. And the new resources here, it's two, three things. First of, first of all, the one that we talk about, 
the non-revenue water, we have to put on a place a very, very sound uh, distribution system that can be used digitalization in order to, to trace every drop of water where it goes. Second is the wastewater treatment. The wastewater is not wastewater, it's a new resource that you need to put on a place, uh, what we call it biofactories. The biofactories now is about making fresh water either for drinking after you put it on the on the on the desalination facility or for the agricultural factor but at the same time the same entity can produce its own uh, biogas the methane so thinking about this what what prevent us to do it Roger is the laws and regulation because if you are a producer of energy you cannot use the energy so then there is a need those beautiful uh, initiative that require us to think out of the box and change the laws. We have to change the laws that govern water and energy in order to be successful. The third one is the, what we call it, the desalination. The desalination now is, is, is the only solution viable for the future and for me it is the one that linked together the environment, green mid agenda, water agenda, as well as the sustainable blue economy agenda, where now it is the sea that can give us the water, and also the sea can give us also the energy to produce it, because we can have a float, uh, floating system that produces energy to run these desalination facilities. At the same time, in the energy deficiency, what, what, what people are now doing? Europe goes to the south, Egypt, Morocco, Algeria, Tunis, and now Jordan. After the COP27, all governments sign uh, agreements with, with different governments in order to start bolstering the green hydrogen. Yes, the answer is a green hydrogen. But how, how, for the sake of God, how you want to produce green hydrogen in countries that they are at water stress? So because each uh, liter of green hydrogen requires us 15 liters of water. So this is, the, this is the thing that I am trying to prove to everybody that everything is connected. We have to stop thinking about the silos. We have to connect the silos together. I'm not saying that we need to have a water, a minister that govern everything. No, we need to have many ministers, whatsoever minister can come. But we need to have a policy framework of action, law, and governance system that will make those technicians to make a, a system that can work for the sustainable development. And these, all of these aspects cannot be achieved if we don't bought the investment. This is why in my division, I'm always uh, working with many of our uh, friends and colleagues from all around the world in order to bolster the, uh, the, the investment. And the investment here is not only the donor cooperation money that we bring from AFD or GFW, it is the money that can also bring the IFI, the International Financial Institute, as well as the uh, uh, private sector. Private sector, can, any private sector can they put their money if there is a political instability? This is a question, you can answer it. So this is how I again call for that coupling all these policy framework for action for a political will and to try to identify what prevent our private sector as an example to invest in Catalonia or to invest in Palestine or to invest on uh, Greece or Cyprus. So those are elements that can be tackled and maybe in the next round I can uh, elaborate more. The last point of, of my discussion to give it to Arnold, also the World Bank today said clearly that out of 10 crises in the world, nine of them are water-related crises. So this is the climate change, water. Thank you. Thank you. Uh <laughs> Thank you, dear, uh, dear Ambassador. We know that you have been actively uh, working for a new um, ministerial meeting on water. The last one was held in Malta uh, in 2017, uh, and we know that there are that there will be progress uh, on this in the uh, in the coming uh, in the coming months because indeed it is very difficult to structure uh, regional governance without um, 
ministers coming together and, and taking a decision uh, that later on has to be has to be implemented. So. Uh, uh, thank you very much. So now let's move to uh, the EU perspective, uh, and we have um, uh, Lorena Stella, who is, as I said, policy advisor uh, on foreign policy at ECO. ECO Climate is, uh, uh, I wouldn't say fairly new uh, uh, think tank uh, in Italy, but already quite uh, well known uh, among audience uh, of think tanks, very well connected. Uh, and in fact funded by the uh, European Climate Foundation, uh, if I'm not uh, mistaken. So let's go back to the question on how the EU, if that is the case, is modifying uh, its priorities vis-a-vis -vis, uh, climate action uh, in general and the, uh, and the Green Deal and the Green Agenda, and what kind of consequences this can have uh, for the cooperation with the, uh, with the southern and eastern Mediterranean countries. Thank you, Roger, and thanks to everyone who's here today. Uh, I would like to start by uh, drawing on some um, common points that I think are important to, to support uh, what I will say afterwards. Uh, and this is mainly linked with the uh, importance of the Mediterranean region for global energy transition. A lot has already been said uh, in the past uh, two hours, but I think that it is important, first of all, to understand that uh, we need to understand uh, the Mediterranean, to conceive the Mediterranean as a, a unique region uh, between the northern and the southern uh, shore of the Mediterranean, uh, and we really need the Mediterranean vision uh, to do so. So um, I think that also from the EU perspective this should be the starting point number one otherwise it doesn't really make sense to to go ahead we have already said a lot about the the challenge that the mediterranean region as a whole is facing from uh, a climate change point of view we have already said that this, this uh, climate change hot suit so i am not going uh, further into that but i think that it is important to put on the table the fact that this region and especially its southern shore has always been central uh, to energy uh, dynamics but uh, its relevance in this sense has even increased with the 2022 energy crisis with the Russian invasion of Ukraine and all the implications that this has created on, a, on the global stage. And from that moment on, we have seen that the energy center uh, has moved from east to south, this especially for, for Europe, uh, and uh, the MENA region has acquired even more relevance from an energy perspective. And now that we really need, uh, as we are saying today, and this is the reason why we work here, now that we really need that this, a new uh, shift, uh, we need the focus to shift from fossil fuel to renewables, we see that, again, the Mediterranean region can be extremely relevant. And I think that some data about that are really uh, important uh, to mention. Uh, this is something that we have been working on at ECHO from a more technical point of view. So the technical potential of solar and wind in Northern Africa alone would be sufficient to meet the current and the 2030 demand for electricity for both Europe and Africa, so this is huge. And the solar and wind potential in the Mediterranean region uh, from both shores, so both northern and southern shores, reaches 4.5 terawatt, of which 3.5 terawatt are just on the southern shore alone. The problem is that the reality right now is a bit different as the region as a whole hosts more or less 180 gigawatt of solar and wind and just 10 gigawatt are on the southern shore, which again is the, the, the part of our Mediterranean region which has more potential. So this is where we stand right now, but still there is a long way to go and a lot of potential that we could uh, we could cover so we really need and the eu of course as a uh, an important actor of the region really need to make the step between uh, potential and pragmatism to um, understand how this region can also respond to the commitments that we advanced at COP28, where just uh, to, to remember, all countries signed uh, the consensus to triple global renewable energy capacity by 2030. And of course, this also means that uh, in the Mediterranean, we need uh, to understand how to make this happen, also from a, a relational pattern point of view. And I think it is also key to uh, understand that the way 
uh, that northern and southern Mediterranean uh, countries will uh, come together to do so has a relevance at a um, broader perspective since the region seems to um, somehow uh, represent uh, in some way the uh, nor global north, global south dynamics. So the way that these two, the two different shores of the Mediterranean will manage to come together to uh, face this challenge and to overcome this challenge can really tell us something about how the two uh, unfortunately divided part of the world nowadays can come together and close the, this dividing gap. Uh, um, Talking about this today uh, means talking about this in a window of political opportunity, which is represented, as you were mentioning before, by the upcoming appointment of a new European Commission, but also by uh, other important international um, appointments that are uh, just ahead of us, uh, like the, uh, the discussions on climate finance that are uh, already happening and that will happen uh, more and more in the coming months ahead of COP29, but also the uh, update of the National Determined Contributions, the NDCs, which is expected for uh, 2025. So this is really a moment where uh, we need to, um, to plan uh, for a decarbonization of the Mediterranean uh, region as a whole, not just Europe or the MENA region, but the two, uh, the two shores uh, together. Uh, for this reason, I think that there are some uh, priorities that uh, the new European Commission will need to focus on. Uh, on, um, let's say, in the broader sense, I think that these two priorities belong to two different levels. One is trying to uh, um, uh, contribute to uh, the acceleration of energy transition processes in southern Mediterranean countries. And the other part is uh, the progressive integration within the two shores of the Mediterranean uh, region. So I would, I would say that there are these two levels which are very much interconnected. For what concerns the first level, which is again the, the advancement of the energy transition processes in these very potential uh, southern Mediterranean countries, that is of course uh, the need for operative and financial support to southern Mediterranean countries, especially to um, uh, Northern Africa, but also Middle Eastern countries, in the, not just in the development, but also in the implementation, as you were saying before, of their uh, national long-term energy pathways, which is, of course, the uh, first condition also to outline and to develop an orderly and just transition, namely for fossil fuel producing countries. Of course, and I think that uh, our other speaker will delve uh, more into that, there also is the um, key area of adaptation, which cannot be uh, overlooked, uh, neither from a political nor from a financial point of view. I think that this is a very key point when we talk about climate change, because if the EU uh, ignore adaptation, this uh, risks jeopardizing all uh, the other uh, efforts to uh, promote prosperity, to promote stability in the so-called European Southern neighborhood, which is not a, a term that I love, to be honest, but since if the, um, the goal of the EU and its foreign policy in the region is also to is also, or firstly, to promote uh, prosperity and stability. This cannot happen if we do not tackle uh, adaptation. And of course, this is also strongly linked with uh, migration and with climate as a driver for migration. For what concerns the other level, meaning the, uh, the integration, of, uh, further integration of the two shores, there are, of course, two key uh, uh, points. One is uh, the industry. So we really need to settle the condition to uh, turn uh, the Mediterranean into a green energy uh, industrial space where uh, green value chains can develop. And this, of course, entails extensive uh, cross-Mediterranean cooperation uh, at all levels of the value chains from um, carbon pricing mechanism, of course, CBAM on one hand, but carbon pricing mechanism on the other, but also sharing technology uh, and knowledge to really create a, a shared space. And the other key point to create a one energy space powered by renewable energy in the Mediterranean, of course, is the interconnection of electricity grids from a horizontal point of view in Northern Africa, for example, but also from a vertical point of view, so from south to north, as we are seeing happening with the uh, ELMED. So um, needless to say, just to conclude, this is a process of integration which uh, um, entails the existence of a shared direction in the Mediterranean, which draws on uh, common and shared, even if, of course, differentiated interests. 
And all of this needs to be uh, framed within a, a shared vision for the Mediterranean, which is supported by clear and ambitious target, especially for uh, the deployment of renewable energies, which, as I was saying before, is a, um, an area where our region has a tremendous uh, potential. Thank you. Well. Uh, thank you very much, Lorena, for, uh, for very clear uh, ideas. Uh, I think that we will have uh, time afterwards during the debate because, as, as you have seen, uh, well, uh, Lorena comes from, uh, from Italy. Now we have another uh, Italian speaker that I will introduce you uh, immediately. Uh, and the Italian government uh, has taken stakes, uh, clear stakes, on the issue of, uh, of climate change and the, uh, and the Green Deal. So I'm sure that there will be questions uh, around this, uh, this particular and maybe controversial uh, uh, point. But let us now move to our next uh, speaker, uh, who is um, Aldo Liga. Uh, he's here from ISPI. ISPI is the largest Italian think tank uh, on international relations. Um, based in Milan, uh, with which we have had uh, well, uh, cooperation for decades, uh, and they are uh, notably organizing every year the MED Dialogues in, uh, in Rome. Last year you cancelled, I think, yes, uh, but this one. year you, you're going to hold it, uh, exactly. hold it again, yeah. which is, of course, a very large uh, meeting. And Aldo, in particular, he's a researcher uh, on, uh, on the transition uh, and the energy sector uh, of North African uh, and Middle Eastern countries, and he's going to um, speak more specifically on the evolution uh, in, these, uh, in these economies towards the, towards the green transition. So, Aldo. Yeah, yeah, so uh, thank you, Roger, and thank uh, to uh, Yemed for inviting me. Uh, I, um, I would like to draw attention to three points that seem to me to be interesting um, to, to be stressed, uh, trying to avoid overlaps with uh, what um, has been said uh, by um, uh, our uh, colleagues uh, before. Uh, so as we have already um, said, uh, climate change is already having a huge impact on the region, um, particularly in economic and um, and, uh, and, and social uh, terms, but there is uh, the concrete risk that uh, there are spillover, uh, spillovers uh, on the political level at, the cert at a certain point. Second point of my presentation, the countries of the region are not sufficiently engaged in the process of energy transition in climate change mitigation and adaptation um, um, uh, efforts. There are some notable exceptions, as we have said, in, in Morocco, for example, in um, in the Gulf, let's say, but even in, in, uh, in, uh, in these cases, the extent of this effort is not uh, sufficient nor realistic. Third and last point of my presentation on the fact that the current uh, instability in the region uh, and uh, um, at the global level is uh, delaying what is needed to tackle climate change. So on the first time on how climate change is affecting the MENA region, we have already um, uh, seen a lot of, uh, of data on uh, water stress, on raising temperatures, sea level rise, etc., etc. Just to give you uh, some examples, if you um, have opened newspapers uh, of uh, countries of the region in recent days, you uh, have found the fact that in Morocco the production of cereals fell by 40 percent and this was due uh, to the drought last year. Uh, you have found that in Egypt the, uh, the speed of trains have been uh, reduced because it is not uh, sure for uh, passengers to, uh, to, uh, to take a train with, uh, with the very high temperatures the uh, the country experienced until some uh, days ago because there is a concrete risk for uh, the uh, the security of and the safety of the of the infrastructure and and this is quite shocking uh, as you have seen in uh, in Saudi Arabia uh, temperatures approaching 52 degrees have uh, um, uh, have killed uh, more than 1,300 pilgrims so. I mean, the, 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 the number of, of casualties, of, of victims of climate change is already straightforward. 
straightforward in, in, in the region. So looking at the extent um, to, to which climate change is already pervasive of the daily life of, uh, of uh, citizens, a state of, of the MENA region, we should expect a strong commitment of local government, governments in both adaptation and mitigation measures. But if we look at these efforts, actually, uh, the um, uh, we see that uh, the progress are not, uh, not uh, uh, enough and that the energy transition is not um, sufficiently engaged. Um, we have talked a lot of the last editions of the uh, UN climate um, conferences in Sharm, Sharm El Sheikh two years ago in Dubai last year and uh, until uh, some months ago we we felt that um, the MENA was at the very center of global climate action. There was a raft of energy partnerships signed between the EU and uh, Morocco, for example, with, with Egypt most, uh, most recently, uh, a lot of uh, agreements between um, states, but also the private sector for the building of renewable energy plants. Uh, a lot of emphasis on uh, the prospect of, for um, exports uh, of green hydrogen from Morocco, Egypt and, and, and the Gulf, on the possible connection of energy grids between um, uh, the uh, Southern European Union, North Africa and the Eastern Mediterranean. So the question uh, is now, but are these prospects real actually? Is the decarbonization path in the MENA region a reality or a myth? Um, I will provide some data to try to answer. Today, the Middle East and North Africa is the region that needs to increase the most at a world level its renewable energy capacity if it wants to respect the Paris Agreement. A 12-fold scale-up is needed, so it is not um, a small progress that we are looking uh, for. Uh, we talk a lot uh, about cooperation, but if we want to um, import green electricity from, uh, from um, uh, North Africa, uh, we need that the countries of the region um, have electricity to, uh, to, to export before for their, uh, to satisfy their domestic uh, consumptions, but then um, a surplus to, to export. Uh, we see that Morocco, for example, which is clearly the leader of the energy transition, is um, is uh, North Africa is failing uh, its target of uh, installed electricity uh, capacity and uh, um, in, uh, they um, should have been 42% in 2020. Uh, now only 37% of um, installed electricity capacity in Morocco is from renewable energy sor uh, source sources. Uh, it is of course a very impressive result but it's not uh, sufficient. Um, uh, and is not in line with what the, the, the government decided. The European Union funded um, uh, this new uh, power line uh, connecting Italy and, uh, and uh, Tunisia that El will Met. be, uh, El Med, exactly, yeah. that will be the second uh, electricity connection between uh, North Africa and uh, and, um, uh, and Europe, uh, but actually at the moment there is absolutely nothing to, to export because uh, Tunisia does not have uh, any electricity surplus, uh, nor any renewable electricity uh, capacity. Actually, uh, last year um, trade unions, not last year, four years, trade unions hampered the, uh, the connection of the um, very uh, few electricity, renewable electricity capacity built in the country to the power grid. So we, there are a lot of problems of regulation in Tunisia and now we are talking about exporting el green electricity, but what el uh, green electricity? There are problems of technologies. Um, hydrogen, green hydrogen is not proven from a um, uh, technological and uh, an economic point of view as carbon capture and storage. Carbon capture and storage is the secret of the carbon neutrality strategy of Gulf countries, but actually it is not uh, um, feasible in, in this moment and we need the energy transition now, not in, in, uh, in 20 years. In terms of adap adaptation measures, we have only one country that have crafted uh, national adaptation uh, plans, which is Kuwait, the other countries have um, um, uh, done nothing at uh, this moment. There are no clear targets concerning uh, energy efficiency. There are a huge financing gap. In the last uh, 30 years, um, uh, the MENA region uh, 
um, attracted 24 billion uh, for um, in climate finance, so it is not um, uh, too much. Uh, and uh, most of them is concentrated in Egypt and Morocco. So all of us have been seduced by this dreamlike uh, prospect for green energy exports in Mediterranean space, but today we can affirm, in my opinion, that uh, we were in front of a sort of institutionalized greenwashing and that this uh, raft of uh, climate and energy uh, transition deals watch much more a uh, foreign policy posture than a, um, a genuine effort to, uh, to decarbonize. The reality is that the, the MENA region is the um, relies on oil and gas much more uh, than uh, anywhere in the world. Energy consumption is on the rise as well as CO2 um, emissions. And this is quite uh, worrying because uh, um, we need to think that uh, climate change is an Im will, will uh, take a toll um, on the countries of the region on a lot of different dimensions. It poses external and internal uh, threats. Um, concerning this, the external threats, of course, there is the problem of uh, failing transboundary uh, water cooperation, as we have already seen in, uh, in, uh, in Iran, and uh, with the competition and, uh, the, um, between Egypt and Sudan uh, on, the, uh, on the dam in, uh, in uh, sorry, Egypt, uh, Egypt and Ethiopia on the, on the new Dam. But climate change poses also domestic uh, challenges for the stability of uh, the, co the political and economic stability of, uh, of, of the region. A substantial proportion of the population of the MENA region and of the economy of the MENA region, 24% so of the GDP, so a lot, uh, a substantial part of that is located in coastal areas uh, which are um, um, exposed to sea level rise. So there is the risk that in some years uh, a lot of critical infrastructure of, of the region will be submerged or, or uh, temporarily out of uh, operation due to sea level rise. Um, not only um, uh, and critical infrastructure such as uh, uh, energy facilities, so the bulk of the economy of uh, um, uh, a lot of countries, desalinization uh, plants, but also ports and logistic uh, um, hubs. hubs. Um, then, uh, climate change is a domestic challenge because uh, I will, because um, uh, climate stress will exacerbate social disparities and fueling uh, protests. Um, climate change uh, doesn't not act alone, but it interferes and um, amplifies pre-existing problems due to lack of maintenance, um, uh, negligence of, uh, of infrastructure. And, and it is quite, and this fuel, uh, can fuel uh, protest and, and the social uh, unrest because there are a lot of uh, responsibilities that are directly imputable to, to, to politicians. Uh, we see that uh, while fires are endemic in North Africa, but uh, in North Africa, the only country uh, which has a fleet of Canadairs is Morocco, for example. Uh, water scarcity is endemic too, but the problem of dam silting is something that could be resolved with money and with political investment. In Libya, the very um, uh, high death toll of the, of the storm there uh, was uh, yes due to the floods and the storm, but the, uh, this is mainly it was mainly a responsibility of the division and the state of conflicts that is ravaging the country, has been ravaging the country since 2011. And all this very gloomy picture is, uh, and I conclude my presentation, uh, worsened by uh, the multiple crises which are affecting the region, of course, e and the global community, of course, in times of. Um, um, uh, fragmentation of the international co uh, community, the space to negotiate ambitious uh, uh, targets uh, um, for um, on um, uh, matters of common interest is very reduced, and so climate change is one of the, uh, the struggle against climate change is one of the first victim of that. The war in Ukraine in some way um, contributed to postpone energy transitions in some countries because it is less urgent to diversify if uh, oil revenues are so high. Algeria is an, is an example of that, of, um, of that. The war in Gaza is having um, 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 also implications for climate. Uh, even in, in uh, I mean, in the, in the long run, the, the Red Sea crisis um, uh, um, um, uh, is um, uh, prolonging the journeys from uh, of the maritime shipping sector from 
um, of um, a lot of weeks uh, because uh, it diverts uh, routes and this um, uh, translate, translates in a substantial increase of CO2 emission. Um, so to, to, uh, to conclude, if uh, there, there are a lot of uh, political and economic consequences and if we delay uh, indefinitely it will be even more challenging in the future as uh, changing the growth model as uh, diversify economy is not something that you do in, uh, in, in two days. Changing the social contract uh, between states and citizens is not something that you do in a couple of years but in a couple of decades. Uh, so it is important to, um, uh, to push the countries of a region to a more systematic efforts uh, um, uh, to um, invest more on existing technologies, on energy savings, on energy efficiency. Uh, the next European uh, um, uh, Commission can have a role in doing that, but it, it is true that it will be depend on the uh, also uh, political composition of the next uh, Commission, and uh, in the moment they are negotiating, but the prospects are, no, are not uh, necessarily uh, positive for a uh, greener uh, EU uh, Commission. Thank you. Thank you, Aldo. Uh, you, in fact, you painted a quite gloomy uh, picture. Uh, and I have to say that we have to remain optimistic. Uh, we have to remain optimistic. And I agree with you that we need to push. Uh, and I'm looking at the, uh, the Moroccan authorities. We need to push. Uh, but at the same time, we need to acknowledge, recognize uh, the efforts uh, that not all the countries, I mean, some because they don't feel uh, appealed, others because they are in the midst of a, uh, of a major crisis, but some have made, and this is something that we need, to, we need to recognize, because at the end of the day, this is also an element that will help uh, these countries uh, move quicker. At the same time, and I'm uh, retaining some of the ideas that some of you already said, uh, starting with uh, uh, Ambassador uh, Abadi, there is a great need to actually um, uh, to raise awareness among, uh, among the general public. I mean, this is not the debate of the elites, because sometimes it is being portrayed as a debate of the elites, and the elites are the only ones concerned with the climate change issue. Uh, and this is not the case. I mean, we need the general public to feel embraced, uh, to feel uh, also appealed by the, by the need to move uh, towards this green transition. Because let's not forget, and we've seen that in other European countries, in France, for instance, a few years ago, that if the general public, if the citizens do not embrace this objective, the, we will not achieve the green transition we will not achieve the green transition. We need the support uh, from, from the population in order to uh, advance. And that's why this green transition needs to be as cohesive uh, as possible and as inclusive as possible. Um, okay, uh, let us now move uh, to our uh, last uh, speaker, uh, Lohan Alfonso, uh, whom, as I said, uh, is, uh, uh, is an expert on civil protection, but he was detaché, he was seconded here at the, uh, at the Union for the Mediterranean uh, from the French government to basically stir up this, uh, this process to build this uh, civil protection uh, mechanism that was put uh, in force uh, as a way to respond in the, uh, in the adaptation uh, or as a way to actually walk across the, the adaptation to, uh, uh, to climate change. Uh, so again, we are very pleased to have you among us. Uh, and now the floor is yours, Laurent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good, uh, good morning, everyone. So I would like, first of all, to personally, uh, Roger and, uh, and Diemet for the invitation and give me the opportunity. I'm very grateful that you, you bridge uh, civil protection with, uh, with uh, climate change and uh, in the context of uh, multiple, uh, uh, multiple uh, uh, crises and also uh, shared the roundtable with so great uh, uh, colleagues, experts and, and, and friends. So if you allow me, I will uh, express my, uh, my note in French. Si la, si la protection civile n'a pas d'expertise de, euh, fondamentale en matière de, de changement climatique, en sa dimension connaissance scientifique, elle s'en nourrit. Euh, et c'est même devenu vital pour le service que les autorités doivent de protéger le, le citoyen. 
étudier, évaluer, mesurer, monitorer pour anticiper les futures crises que le changement climatique pourrait générer ou exacerber, des discussions et des échanges en Europe et avec les pays du Sud. Les principaux acteurs sont la Commission européenne, l'Union pour la Méditerranée, bien sûr, ou encore UNDRR, OCDE, et des organisations de la, de la société civile que je voudrais citer, telles que IMED, bien sûr, ou le Centre de recherche de l'Université euh, euh, de Chypre, européenne de Chypre, et la Fondation euh, bien connue en Espagne et, et ici en particulier en Catalogne, la Fondation Pau Costa, ou les deux fondations majeures que sont euh, CMCC et, et, et CHIMA. La gouvernance des nouveaux modèles et systèmes de protection civile au du citoyen au national en passant par le, par le sous-régional sont des clés de réussite pour jeter les fondations de sociétés résilientes, pour lutter et s'adapter aux risques naturels ou induits par l'homme. Les instabilités, les instabilités du, du bassin méditerranéen entraînent un besoin de plus de protection civile, au sens littéral, de protéger le citoyen. Certains pays ont développé des concepts plus intégrés de défense civile, tels que le royaume de Jordanie, ou de sécurité civile, comme en France. Ces modèles de protection civile doivent être agiles, adaptifs, adaptatifs et apprenants, pour faire face aux scénarios connus et capables de piloter dans l'incertitude et dans les effets directs ou indirects du changement climatique, des effets dominos, cumulatifs ou en cascade. Comme vous le savez, la Commission européenne et ECO, en charge de la protection civile et de l'aide humanitaire, ont développé le mécanisme de protection civile de l'Union en 2001, au départ visant à apporter une réponse capacitaire en situation de catastrophe à tout État qui le demande. L'éventail d'instruments... Sorry, ah, you have to change... Oh, it doesn't work very well. Please. Now it's... Sorry for this technical issue, and uh, will follow my my notes. So, comme vous le savez, donc la, la, la Commission européenne et la DG Eco euh, ont initié le, le, le mécanisme de protection civile de l'Union en 2001, qui visait à apporter une réponse capacitaire en situation de catastrophe à tout État qui la demande. Et l'éventail d'instruments s'est étoffé aujourd'hui avec un véritable programme de prévention et de préparation tant pour les États membres et participants au mécanisme, qui sont aujourd'hui au nombre de 37, que pour les pays des voisinages sud et est de l'Union européenne qui sont éligibles. Des instruments tels que le PPRD MED, qui est dans sa quatrième phase, est un programme emblématique Euromed initié à la création de l'Union pour la Méditerranée en 2008, rappelant que cette thématique est identifiée parmi les priorités d'action de cette organisation pour laquelle je travaillais encore il y a quelques jours, J'évoquais précédemment le système de gestion intégré du royaume de Jordanie, et c'est précisément là que je vais travailler dans les prochaines semaines pour la défense civile avec l'ambassade de France et également pour les territoires palestiniens. Cette trajectoire professionnelle qui s'inscrit aussi dans une évolution nécessaire, un angle de travail vers une coopération accrue, régionale et sous-régionale. J'ai coutume de dire qu'on ne peut envisager une coopération internationale si on ne dispose pas d'un système national solide, mature et performant, qui constitue une base reconnue par ses citoyens et peut constituer une fierté, l'expression de valeurs d'humanisme et parfois d'un outil diplomatique. En ce sens, le dialogue professionnel initié par UNOCHA, relayé par la DG ECO et soutenu par l'Union pour la Méditerranée et Chypre, entre Jordanie, Israël et Palestine, sont un exemple de coopération vertueuse, en dépit des réalités géopolitiques, j'y reviendrai. Malheureusement, le bassin méditerranéen ne manque pas par ses spécificités géographiques, topographiques et météorologiques, de nous rappeler combien nous sommes exposés et vulnérables aux risques majeurs naturels, les feux de forêt au Portugal, Grèce, Chypre, Algérie ou France, les inondations terribles en Libye à Derna, et particulièrement les crues éclairs, les tremblements de terre, Maroc, Turquie, et les risques industriels, l'explosion du port de Beyrouth en 2020 ou l'explosion au port d'Aqaba en Jordanie. Outre le besoin de connaissances scientifiques, que j'évoquais en préambule, il faut savoir l'analyser et le rendre accessible aux acteurs de terrain pour qu'ils développent des plans de prévention, d'action, de prévision et de réponse qui engagent tous les acteurs de la société. C'est une mosaïque de partenaires qui doit s'articuler autour de leviers synchronisés, reposant sur des corpus réglementaires, législatifs, réfléchis, admis et appliqués, qui peut passer par des plateformes de gestion des risques de désastres et de réduction des risques, 
multisectorielle en incluant les risques systémiques, et je pense ici particulièrement aux infrastructures critiques. L'Union pour la Méditerranée, comme le précisait Roger, a développé avec le soutien de la DGECO une plateforme régionale, des groupes de travail thématiques pour l'alimenter, un plan d'action horizon 2030, jouant le véritable rôle d'un incubateur pour un cadre méditerranéen de protection civile, en miroir, en extension du mécanisme de protection civile de l'Union. La plateforme régionale vise à établir un dialogue, un langage commun, mettre en place une harmonisation des processus, des protocoles d'intervention, d'interopérabilité, de partage des bonnes pratiques et retour d'expérience en matière de gestion des risques de désastre. Les challenges sont devant nous, mais nous pouvons les appréhender avec optimisme et confiance, parce que nos sociétés méditerranéennes qui demandent plus de protection face aux risques courants, comme les feux d'habitation, accidents de circulation, secours à personne, sont bien sûr impactées par le changement climatique et subissent des mutations au quotidien. On pourrait citer les nouveaux matériaux de construction, des bâtiments plus isolants mais aussi plus inflammables, les énergies nouvelles telles que l'éolien ou les fermes solaires qui demandent d'adapter les matériels et les équipements, ou encore les véhicules électriques et demain à hydrogène qui sollicitent de nouveaux protocoles de la part des intervenants de terrain. Les catastrophes d'ampleur viennent s'ajouter comme une couche supplémentaire d'exposition du, du citoyen, comme une épée de Damoclès entraînant des chocs, et les amortisseurs doivent être anticipés. La DG ECO a lancé l'initiative d'objectifs de résilience au désastre que l'Union pour la Méditerranée prolonge dans ses travaux en complément du cadre Sendai. Ces challenges pour lesquels la plupart des pays méditerranéens sont sensibilisés doivent mettre en cohérence analyse et couverture des risques, ce qui est coûteux en temps, en termes de politique publique et de finances. Les stratégies de coopération transfrontalière ou régionale prennent alors tout leur sens pour échanger, collaborer, pratiquer et mutualiser. Le premier que je voudrais mentionner comme exemple concret de développement, c'est l'exemple algéro-tunisien en matière de feux de forêt et inondations à la frontière nord-tunisienne, à Tabarka, et avec des bassins de risque communs avec l'Ouest de Medjerda. Cela passe par des accords bilatéraux prévoyant des partages d'informations, d'échanges d'experts dans leurs académies nationales respectives. Et je veux citer ici le renforcement de la coopération entre le Royaume du Maroc et l'Espagne en matière de feux de forêt. Je terminerai en citant l'exemple que j'ai cité, euh, supra, de coopération régionale entre la Jordanie, Israël et Palestine, même s'il est freiné depuis le 7 octobre, qui peut assurer que nous n'aurons pas, en simultané, un séisme majeur sur la faille du Levant, dans la vallée du Jourdain, qui affecterait profondément Amman, Ramallah ou Jérusalem dans un contexte de conflit. Chacun doit s'y préparer pour organiser une réponse nationale et potentiellement recevoir une assistance internationale. C'est en ce sens qu'un exercice de grande ampleur simulant un tremblement de terre avait été organisé en mars 2023 à Jéricho entre les trois parties. Le sens des réalités l'emportera toujours. La prévalence de la protection et la sécurité des populations doit nous guider vers une gestion globale des risques. Le pays qui choisirait l'isolement et l'autosuffisance est condamné à assumer de lourdes pertes humaines matériel et économique face aux catastrophes. Ce n'est pas le chemin que la Méditerranée a pris. L'Europe et l'Union pour la Méditerranée développent des efforts communs avec les 43 États membres pour obtenir des résultats tangibles et concertés. Je vous remercie. Thank you, uh, Laurent. Uh, that was a clear example of, uh, of a positive uh, action and coordinated action among the, uh, the 43 uh, UFM uh, member countries. Uh, it was in the beginning uh, in the spirit of the contribution that uh, the French authorities, the French government wanted to, uh, to, um, to give to the UFM. That's why they send you here for, uh, for two years. Now let's hope that this endeavor will continue and that the works that you uh, initiated uh, with the rest of the of the UFM team will uh, will continue to uh, to move on because it's uh, indeed it's 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 a demand from the uh, from the member states of the um, uh, of the UFM that such a mechanism uh, exists and is uh, and is properly deployed okay 
So we have now some time before the coffee break, not much, uh, because we are running late, as, uh, as it often happens in, uh, in this kind of conferences. But before asking question, uh, questions to our panelists, I would like to give the, the floor to you, uh, because this is supposed to be uh, also an interactive uh, discussion. So um, if there are no questions, uh, then I have uh, like lots of questions. We could be here for two or three hours, uh, but I, I would prefer you to ask uh, uh, the questions or to make the statements. Um, so please, don't be shy. I know it's the first uh, plenary session. Um, what? Crystal clear, maybe. <laughs> Crystal clear is the ambassador saying. Does anybody have a question? Otherwise, I, I go ahead. Huh? OK, well, uh, not being the case, which is quite uh, surprising, then I have a, a couple of questions. Uh, one, I already uh, advanced it to our dear Italian colleagues, and it has to do with the MATE plan, um, because as you know, the Italian government some months ago uh, launched the MATE plan, which is a bilateral strategy of Italy uh, with, uh, with the African uh, continent, including North Africa. Uh, and therefore, including our part of our of our region. So my question is uh, to you: is uh, how much? I mean, because somehow it's, it's it's difficult to devise the Mate plan because there is not it, it's not a written uh, a written plan, uh, or not so far. Uh, but I would like to know how much uh, does the Mate plan include issues of uh, energy or helping. Uh, the countries, the African countries, and in particular North African countries, advance uh, in the in the energy transition, or is this not a question at all in the uh, in the Mate plan? For me, for Lena, I can maybe we um, we can answer together. So the Mate plan is this new uh, plan uh, approved by the current Italian government to let's say repackage the uh, Italian effort towards North Africa and Africa. At, at the beginning there was a strong focus on migration more than um, than to, uh, to other uh, components of the of the Italian uh, foreign policy to the continent. Now, um, uh, for the moment, we have uh, a law that uh, rules on the, uh, on the plan, so there is a governance structure. It's quite interesting because the government structures um, uh, put together government, different ministries, um, uh, the private sector, the huge, um, the, the main uh, Italian energy companies, infrastructure uh, companies, and NGOs. Um, it's financed with a lot of money, and I don't no remember exactly the amount from the Climate Fund because it's a repackaging, so they took funds from a lot of different, uh, uh, if different uh, tools, at, and if I'm not wrong, the, um, the biggest uh, part of these funds come from the, clim the Italian Climate Fund. Uh, for the moment, so there is this steering committee, there is this structure, and there are um, projects in nine countries, and a lot of them are related uh, to the energy transition and, and, and climate action. Uh, for example, there is a project to build, if I'm not wrong, um, um, a training center on energy transition in, in Morocco. It's something interesting, in my opinion, much more f because there is a clear sign of attention, but at the end, at the, at the moment, the means to implement this effort are quite limited because with uh, 5 billion euros, you can do um, uh, almost um, uh, nothing in, uh, to tackle climate change and improve energy, uh, energy uh, transition. And there are also, uh, for example, projects on, uh, um, uh, on uh, adaptation to climate change in the sector of, uh, of agriculture in Egypt, for example. So there are some pilot, uh, uh, pilot, uh, pilot projects, uh, and the aim is to uh, rebrand, let's say, the Italian uh, uh, development assistance to, to, to the region. Lorena? Yeah, I 
would add that uh, yeah, energy, of course, has always been a, a key interest for Italy in, uh, in Africa, and it is one of the six or seven pillars, that I don't recall right now, of the Mate plan. So it will, of course, uh, play an important role. Renewable energies uh, are mentioned multiple times in the documents that we have at our disposal. We also uh, are concerned that, of course, also the, the other element that is the, the cooperation on the gas with the African countries will still be on the, on the plate, will still be a, a, an important component on, of, of the plan, but right now we don't have any uh, data about that. So we, we have more uh, defined um, programs and projects about renewable energies, while the part about gas are not uh, clearly mentioned in this, uh, in this plan. But still, as uh, Aldo was saying, uh, this is uh, also uh, an attempt to rebrand what is already ongoing about the cooperation with, uh, uh, with Africa. Uh, so the, the fear, uh, if I can call it like that, is uh, that uh, this is a, a sort of framework in which we can put everything that is already uh, ongoing, that is already on progress with, uh, uh, with African countries. So, uh, of course, there will be new projects, there will be innovative elements, but there also might be a continuation of the uh, same patterns of cooperations that we had before and that we still have with African countries. Uh, for what concerns uh, uh, the transition uh, uh, sector, there is also uh, an important focus uh, on uh, biofuels. Uh, uh, and this might also be another uh, concern because, of course, we think that the, the, biggest, uh, uh, the biggest element of cooperation should be renewable energies. First, for uh, the, the consumption of uh, Northern African and African countries and then for export. So I think that these are some elements that we should uh, uh, keep clear when, when we, we uh, talk about the plan. Uh, still, as you were saying, we don't have the, the, the complete picture even uh, in Italy, but we are trying to, <laughs> yeah, to, to understand you. more. Thank you. Any other questions, remarks? Then I have a second and last uh, question, and I'm daring to uh, raise the elephant in the room, because nobody of you referred to the issue of subsidies. And uh, we have... Um, as you know, a very subsidized uh, region. So we have subsidies on water, we have subsidies on electricity, we have subsidies uh, on food. Uh, for many years, uh, certain voices have been advocating to phase out these subsidies. If we phased out these subsidies, then a big bulk uh, of the population would be excluded. So, of course, governments will not move towards phasing out subsidies uh, like this. But still, I have the impression that the issue of subsidies is sometimes uh, one of the consequences of these subsidies uh, is sometimes locking out um, part of the investment that could be mobilized from the private sector, especially into the renewable uh, uh, sector. So, Almotas, is the issue of subsidies somehow discussed at the, uh, at the uh, UFM level, at the ministerial level? And, uh, and if so, how is this tackled uh, from the side of the, uh, of the government? Thank you, thank you very much for this question. Actually, the, we have li, uh, introduced the financial strategy for the water sector and also for the climate action. And one of the main elements that was addressed from the 10 actions that need to be done in order to bolster the socio-economic uh, development in terms of uh, services is the, how to best uh, mobilize the internal revenue of different sectors. And one of them is absolutely the polluter pay principle, uh, aspect to the full cost recovery for these services. And the subsidy was one of the elements. I think the subsidy is needed, but the way that we subsidize should be changed at certain stage. So once you talk about subsidizing the energy and the water sector, then you are not achieving the objective of the full cost recovery because you are subsidizing all the nation. Mm -hmm. So uh, the proposal of the Union for the Mediterranean to its member state that we need to work on the full cost recovery of those things, but at the end of the day, we should not ignore 
the people on need for this. Then you need to tackle it from a different framework, which is a social solidarity uh, framework that you need to have a registry to know those who cannot afford the full cost recovery of the services and then treat with them there. In this context, then you, you will be absolutely working on phasing out. Maybe you need five, six years, but you will not phase out subsidy if it is given for everybody. It will be becoming something that a political commitment from the government to the citizen, anytime they want to change it, then it will make a demonstration on the street. But uh, thinking out of the box, this is the way that we recommend our member state to do. We did not force them and because we don't have the mechanism. Thank not you. yet, not yet. <laughs> and I don't think that will be. <laughs> Thank you. Any other uh, comment on, on this question? Or you want to no? Okay. Well, if this is not the case and uh, I'm being um, yeah, targeted by my colleagues that, um, that we need to move now to the, to the coffee break, uh, to conclude, uh, just to say that I think that all the, uh, the outstanding speakers to whom I would like to thank wholeheartedly for their uh, intervention here today agreed that there is a need to overcome certain barriers uh, to face the need to move towards or to speed up uh, the green transition. We have legal and regulatory barriers uh, that uh, some of them um, uh, have, uh, have expressed. Now we were discussing one of the, not the main, but one of the elements uh, in the picture, which is the issue of, uh, uh, of subsidies, but we also have uh, issues like the, the feeding tariff schemes that are not properly properly address the issue that uh, Lorena was addressing on the interconnections um, uh, and in a way the independence uh, or not independence of the uh, regulatory uh, authorities and along with the issues of legal uh, and regulatory barriers we also have a tremendous here challenge which is uh, the financial barriers and here of course, uh, solving, uh, tackling the financial barriers that exist to mobilize uh, the private sector into this operation. That doesn't mean that the private sector is not mobilized. We have many positive examples, Morocco, Jordan, uh, Egypt, uh, where we see uh, private sector uh, being mobilized. There are elements that are not economic, that have to do with the, uh, with the geopolitical environment, with the risks associated with, uh, with these uh, investments that, of course, jeopardize uh, a smooth transition uh, in, in many of the countries uh, of the region. Uh, but still, uh, as I told Aldo before, I think we, 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 we have to stay and keep uh, positive and optimistic uh, in this endeavor because at the end of the day, this is a joint struggle. It's a common struggle that depasses uh, the region. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, as it is um, a phenomenon that touches uh, unevenly uh, both the south and the north of the Mediterranean, uh, we need to work together. And it's one of the areas in which not only cooperation uh, already exists, but if I may say so, in the future, we will need to strengthen it. So thank you very much and uh, looking forward to the next sessions. Thank you.